The title of this second lecture, of course, an opinion, is borrowed from my favorite philosopher, David Hume. Uh, I'll read you the relevant passage in a moment. Uh, exactly as yesterday, for those of you who are here, uh, there is a very strong temptation to drop this topic and to talk about a different one, uh, namely the current crisis in the Gulf. And again, I'm going to resist it, rightly or wrongly. Uh, I want to talk about what I think are background issues relevant to uh, comprehending what's going on, or at least so it seems to me. Yesterday I talked some about the historical framework, uh, the Cold War era, what I think lies ahead. Today I want to consider a different dimension, a different kind of background feature, uh, this time having to do with American society. Uh, it's uh, an interesting society, apart from the fact that we live there, here, I guess. It's, it's a very free society, probably the freest in the world. Uh, it's, probably, it's the only society in the world, as far as I know, uh, where there actually is a commitment to freedom of speech, a serious commitment. I literally don't know of any other one. Uh, uh, and it follows that public opinion could, uh, at least in principle, have quite a large impact on state policy. In fact, sometimes it does, although generally only in indirect ways, outside the political system uh, and outside of other formal channels, usually expressing itself outside the media and the other major channels of opinion, journals of opinion. Well, assumption, as these are assumptions from which I start. I'll talk about them. Uh, and these assertions ought to be controversial. I hope they are. I think they're true. I think they're important. I think they're also important with regard to the present crisis in the Gulf and to others that will follow. Well, these are the background issues that I'd like to talk about. And again, as yesterday, I'll be quite glad to uh, talk about more immediate concerns uh, later on. Uh, turning now to Hume, uh, in his first principles of government, Hume found nothing more surprising than to see the easiness with which the many are governed by the few, and to observe the implicit submission with which men resign their own sentiments and passions to those of their rulers. When we inquire by what means this wonder is brought about, we shall find that as force is always on the side of the governed, the governors have nothing but to, to support them but opinion. It is therefore on opinion only that government is founded, and this maxim extends to the most despotic and most military governments, as well as to the most free and most popular. I'll refer to that as Hume's paradox. Uh, well, Hume was uh, an astute observer, and this paradox of government is, I think, very much to the point. I think that insight explains something important about modern history, namely why elites are so dedicated to indoctrination and thought control, actually a major and much too unexplored theme. Uh, the public must be put in its place, uh, Walter Lippmann wrote, Dean of American Journalists and a leading progressive democratic theorist. The public must be put in its place so that we may live free of the trampling and the roar of a bewildered herd. That's the public. And if the state lacks the force to coerce and the voice of the people can be heard, then it's necessary to ensure that that voice says the right thing, something that respected intellectuals have been advising for many years. Well, Hume's observation raises a number of questions. It actually has some dubious features. One dubious feature is the idea that force is on the side of the governed. Actually, reality is more grim than that. Uh, nevertheless, I think the paradox is quite real. Even despotic rule, as Hume says, is commonly founded on a measure of consent. And the abdication of rights is uh, the very hallmark of more free societies, and that's a fact that requires analysis. The harsher side of the truth is revealed by the fate of the popular movements of the past decade. Uh, in the Soviet satellites, the governors had ruled by force, not by opinion, uh, and when force was withdrawn, these fragile tyrannies quickly collapsed, for the most part with remarkably little bloodshed, in fact. Uh, these successes have elicited some euphoria about 
the power of love, tolerance, nonviolence, the human spirit, and forgiveness. That's Václav Havel's explanation for the failure of the police and the military to crush the Czech uprising. Uh, that thought is comforting, but I think it's illusory. Actually, uh, the crucial factor was not some novel form of nonviolence uh, or love. Actually, no new ground was broken there. Uh, rather, the crucial fact was the withdrawal of Soviet force and the collapse of the structures of coercion that were based on it. Those who believe otherwise may turn to the may turn for guidance to the ghost of Archbishop Romero and countless others who have sought to confront unyielding terror with the human spirit. Actually, the recent events of Central and Eastern Europe uh, are quite a sharp departure from the historical norm. Throughout modern history, popular forces motivated by radical democratic ideals have sought to combat autocratic rule, and sometimes they have in fact been able to expand the realms of freedom and justice before being brought to heel. Often they're simply crushed. But it's hard to think of another case when established power simply withdrew in the face of a popular challenge. And no less remarkable is the behavior of the reigning superpower, which not only did not bar these developments by force as it had in the past, but even encouraged them alongside of significant internal changes. That's very far from the historical norm. Actually, the historical norm is illustrated in the same years by the dramatically contrasting case of Central America, where any popular effort to overthrow the brutal tyrannies of the oligarchy and the military is met with murderous force, supported or directly organized by the ruler of the hemisphere. Uh, ten years ago, there were signs of hope for an end to the dark ages of terror and misery. Uh, there, was, uh, there were uh, new self-help groups, unions, peasant associations, Christian-based communities, and other popular organizations that might have led the way to democracy and social reform. That prospect elicited a stern response by the United States and its clients with a campaign of slaughter, torture, general barbarism. Uh, early efforts in Nicaragua to direct resources to the poor majority impelled Washington to economic and ideological warfare and outright terror to punish these transgressions by destroying the economy and social life. Uh, and it's worth bearing in mind that enlightened Western opinion regards these consequences as a success insofar as the challenge to power and privilege is rebuffed, and of course insofar as the targets are properly chosen. Uh, killing prominent priests in public view is not clever, but rural activists and union leaders are fair game, and of course peasants, Indians, students, and other lowlife generally. The tactical errors, such as the brutal assassination of the Jesuit intellectuals, are also in fact considered of little account, as we learn by looking closely at the rewards that were given to the assassins, carefully concealed by the instruments of opinion, but quite substantial. I'll explain later if you like. Uh, the comparison between the Soviet and U.S. satellites in the past decade is so striking and so obvious that it requires real dedication not to perceive it. And outside of Western intellectual circles, it's a commonplace. Uh, a writer in the leading Mexican journal, Alexelsior, comments on what he calls the striking contrast between Soviet behavior toward its satellites and U.S. policy in the Western Hemisphere, where intransigence, interventionism, and the application of typical police state instruments have traditionally marked Washington's actions. In Europe, he goes on, the USSR and Gorbachev are associated with the struggle for freedom of travel, political rights, and respect for public opinion. In the Americas, the U.S. and Bush are associated with indiscriminate bombings of civilians, the organization, training, and financing of death squads, and programs of mass murder. That's not quite the story in New York and Washington, where the United States is hailed as I'm quoting, an inspiration for the triumph of democracy in our time, quoting the New Republic. Uh, in El Salvador, the journal of the murdered Jesuit intellectuals 
uh, who we pretend to respect, but you'll notice that nobody ever quotes what they say, so the respect only goes so far. The Journal of the Murdered Jesuit Intellectuals observed, I'm quoting, if Le Quaresa had been doing his organizing work in El Salvador, he would have already entered into the ranks of the disappeared at the hands of heavily armed men dressed in civilian clothes, or he would have been blown to pieces in a dynamite attack on his Union, on his union headquarters. If Alexander Dubček were a politician in our country, he would have been assassinated, assassinated like Hector O'Kelly, who was the social democratic leader assassinated in Guatemala, probably by Salvadoran death squads. If Andrei Sakharov had worked here in favor of human rights, he would have met the same fate as Herbert Amaya, who's one of the many murdered leaders of the independent Salvadoran Human Rights Commission. If Ota Sik or Václav Havel had been carrying out their intellectual work in El Salvador, they would have woken up one sinister morning, lying on the patio of a university campus with their heads destroyed by the bullets of an elite army battalion. Well, these are truisms, uh, but one will search far to find them expressed in U.S. commentary or the West in general, which much prefers uh, largely meaningless, though self-flattering, comparisons between Eastern and Western Europe. Central America represents the historical norm, not Eastern Europe, and Hume's observation requires that correction. Uh, recognizing that, it still remains true and important that government is typically founded on modes of submission short of force, even where force is available as a last resort. Now, in the contemporary period, Hume's insight has in fact been revived and it's been elaborated, but with a crucial innovation. Control of thought is more important for governments that are free and popular than for despotic and military states. And the logic is quite straightforward. A despotic state can control its domestic enemy, the population, by force. But as the state loses the power to coerce, other devices are required to prevent the ignorant masses from interfering with public affairs, which are none of their business. Uh, this problem of putting the public in its place, that became a major problem back in the mid-17th century, at the time of what one historian correctly calls the first great outburst of democratic thought in history, namely the English Revolution of mid-century. Uh, that awakening of the general populace raised the problem of how to contain the threat. The intellectuals of the time condemned the libertarian ideas of the radical Democrats who favored such horrifying notions as universal education, guaranteed health care, democratization of the law, developing a kind of liberation theology, which one critic ominously observed, preached seditious doctrine to the people and aimed to raise the rascal multitude against all men of best quality in the kingdom to draw them into associations and combinations with one another against all lords, gentry, ministers, lawyers, rich and peaceable men. Uh, the radical Democrats, he continued, had made the people so curious and so arrogant that they would never find humility enough to submit to a civil rule. The rabble did not want to be ruled by king or parliament, the two contestants for power in our version of history. Uh, rather, they wanted to be ruled, as they put it, by countrymen like ourselves that know our wants. Their pamphlets explain that it will never be a good world while knights and gentlemen make us laws that are chosen for fear and do but oppress us and do not know the people's sores. Now, ideas of that sort naturally were appalling to the men of best quality. They were willing to grant the people rights, but within reason and on the principle that the gentry, as they put it, were truly the people, not the rascal multitude. Uh, after the Democrats had been defeated, John Locke commented that day laborers and tradesmen, spinsters and dairy maids, must be told what to believe. The greatest part cannot know, and therefore they must believe. Actually, like John Milton and other civil libertarians of the period, Locke had a very sharply limited conception of freedom of expression. In fact, his position was that the general public had no right even to discuss public affairs. Uh, you don't read this in what you read of Locke's in political science courses, but if you take a look at the, he was a civil servant 
And if you look at the constitutions that he wrote, for example, the Constitution of the Carolinas, uh, it literally bars the discussion of public affairs on the part of the public as illegitimate. Uh, the, he, did, he did, in fact, oppose censorship in 1694, uh, at long after the Democrats had been thoroughly crushed. But if you look at the defense that he gave of, to, to eliminate censorship, uh, there was no question of principle raised at all, just questions of expediency and uh, harm to commercial interests. By that time, as Christopher Hill, one of the main 17th century historians, points out, nothing got into print that frightened the men of property who censored themselves. And in a well-functioning state capitalist democracy like the United States, what might frighten the men of property is generally kept quite far from the public view, sometimes with quite astonishing success. In those years, back in the 17th century, the general public was described as a giddy multitude, beasts in men's shape. It's proper to suppress them, just as it's proper to save the life of a lunatic or a distracted person, even against his will. Uh, if the people are so depraved and corrupt as to confer places of power and trust upon wicked and undeserving men, they forfeit their power in this behalf unto those who are good, though but a few. Uh, now, the good and few may be the gentry or the industrialists, or they may be the vanguard party in the Central Committee, or they may be the intellectuals who qualify as experts because they articulate the consensus of the powerful, paraphrasing one of Henry Kissinger's insights. They manage the business empires, the ideological institutions, the political structures, or they serve them at various levels, and their task is to shepherd the bewildered herd and to keep the giddy multitude in a state of implicit submission and thus to bar the dread prospect of freedom and self-determination. The threat of popular organization to privilege is real enough in itself, but there's a worse problem. The worst problem is that the rot may spread in the terminology of political elites. That is, there may be a demonstration effect of independence and successful development, may even be in, in a form which attends to the people's sores. As I mentioned yesterday, uh, internal documents, and in fact even the public record, reveal that one driving concern of U.S. planners over the years has been the fear that that virus of freedom and independence might spread, infecting regions beyond. And it's worth noting that that concern, very constant in American planning documents, breaks no new ground whatsoever. Uh, European statesmen had the same fears about the American Revolution. Uh, Metternich feared that the American Revolution might lend new strength to the apostles of sedition. It might spread the contagion and the invasion of vicious principles, such as the pernicious doctrines of republicanism and popular self-rule, one of the czar's diplomats warned. A century later, the cast of characters was reversed, though the doctrine stayed the same. Uh, Woodrow Wilson's Secretary of State, Robert Lansing, feared that if the Bolshevik disease were to spread, it would leave the ignorant and incapable mass of humanity dominant in the, on the earth. Uh, the Bolsheviks, he said, were appealing to the proletariat of all countries, to the ignorant and mentally deficient, who by their numbers are urged to become masters, a very real danger in view of the process of social unrest throughout the world. Again, as is constantly the case, it's democracy that's the awesome threat. When soldiers and workers' councils made a brief appearance in uh, Germany, Woodrow Wilson feared that they would inspire dangerous thoughts among the American Negro soldiers returning from abroad, quoting. Already he had heard Negro laundresses were demanding more than the going wage, saying that the money is as much mine as it is yours. Uh, businessmen, he thought, might have to adjust to having workers on their boards of directors, among other disasters, if the Bolshevik virus were not exterminated. Basically, Metternich's view, though reversed now. Uh, with these dire consequences in mind, the Western invasion of the Soviet Union was justified on defensive grounds, as I pointed out yesterday, against the revolution's challenge to the survival of the capitalist order, quoting again John Lewis Gaddis. And it was only natural 
that the defense of the United States should extend from invasion of the Soviet Union to uh, Woodrow Wilson's Red Scare at home. Uh, again, as Secretary of State Lansing pointed out, force must be used, quoting him, to prevent the leaders of Bolshevism and anarchy from proceeding to organize or preach against government in the United States. The government must not permit these fanatics to enjoy the liberty which they now seek to destroy. Uh, and the Woodrow Wilson administration launched a very successful repression. This was prior to the days when freedom of speech was regarded as a value in the United States, contrary to what many people believe. It's rather recent. Uh, they successfully undermined democratic politics, unions, uh, freedom of the press and independent thought generally in the interests of corporate power and the state authorities who represented its interests. All of this was done with the general approval of the media and the elites generally, all in self-defense against the ignorant and mentally deficient majority. Actually, much the same story was reenacted after World War II at that time under the pretext of a Soviet threat in reality to restore submission to the rulers. Uh, when Political life and independent thought revived in the 1960s. The problem arose again, and the reaction was the same. The Trilateral Commission, which brought together liberal elites from Europe, Japan, and the United States, basically the group around Jimmy Carter and his uh, administration, so the kind of liberal side of the international ruling class, uh, they warned of an impending crisis of democracy, as they called it, because segments of the public were entering the political arena. This was, they said, an excess of democracy, and it was posing a threat to the unhampered rule of privileged elites. Now, that's what's called democracy in political theology. And the problem was the usual one. The rabble were trying to arrange their own affairs, trying to gain control over their communities, pursue their political demands. There were organizing efforts among various groups, young people, ethnic minorities, women, social activists, and others. And in fact, they were encouraged by the, you know, the virus was spreading. They were encouraged by the struggles of the United Masses elsewhere for freedom and independence. The Trilateral Commission urged, therefore, that more moderation in democracy would be required. Perhaps a return to the days when Truman had been able to govern the country with the cooperation of a relatively small number of Wall Street lawyers and bankers as the American contributor commented, Professor Samuel Huntington of Harvard. Uh, the fears that were expressed by the men of best quality in the 17th century, they've actually become a major theme of intellectual discourse, corporate practice, and also the academic social sciences, far more so than people tend to realize. Uh, they were expressed, for example, by the influential moralist and uh, foreign affairs advisor, Reinhold Niebuhr, who was described as the theologian of the establishment, much revered by George Kennan, the Kennedy intellectuals, and many others. Uh, he wrote that rationality belongs to the cool observers, while the common person follows not reason but faith. Now, the cool observers must recognize the stupidity of the average man and must provide necessary illusion and emotionally potent oversimplifications that will keep the naive simpletons on course. Exactly as in 1650, it remains necessary to protect the ignorant rabble from their own depraved and corrupt judgments, just as one does not allow a three-year-old child to cross the street. That's just ordinary morality. Uh, the intelligent minorities have long understood this need. So going back to Walter Lippmann, uh, he described what he called a revolution in the practice of democracy as the manufacture of consent has become a self-conscious art and a regular organ of popular government. And he said that's a natural development when the common interests very largely elude public opinion entirely and can be managed only by a specialized class whose personal interests reach beyond the locality, that is, the men of best quality who are alone capable of social and economic management. You notice throughout this whole story from 1650 up to the present, whoever's doing the writing is one of the privileged elite who has the responsibility to make decisions and so on and to keep the, um, the rascal multitude under control for their own good, of course. 
Well, Lipman concludes rather logically that in a properly functioning democracy, there are two quite distinct political roles. The first role is that of the responsible men, guys like us, smart people. Uh, they lead opinion, they initiate, they administer, they settle, and they must be protected from ignorant and meddlesome outsiders, the general public, who he says are incapable of dealing with the substance of the problem. That's the first role. And the second role is that of the public. It's much more limited. It's not for the public, he says, to pass judgment on the intrinsic merits of an issue or to offer analysis or solutions. Rather, it's the responsibility of the public on occasion to place its force at the disposal of one or another group of responsible men. In other words, to say, we want you to lead us, not you. That's what's called an election. The bewildered herd, which is trampling and roaring, has its function. Its function is to be, he says, the interested spectators of action, not participants. Participation is the duty of the responsible men. That's in a properly functioning democracy. Now, Lipman's editors, you know, honorable liberal scholars, uh, describe his, these ideas as a progressive political philosophy for liberal democracy. Uh, you'll notice that these ideas have an unmistakable resemblance to the Leninist concept of a vanguard party that leads the stupid masses to a better life that they cannot construct or conceive on their own. And in fact, the transition from one position to the other, that is, from Leninist enthusiasm to service to state capitalist power, that's proven quite an easy one over the years, sometimes called the God that failed syndrome. And the ease of transition is not very surprising, since the doctrines are quite similar at the root. Uh, the critical difference between them really lies in an assessment of the prospects for power through exploitation of popular struggle, or through service to the current masters. Uh, notice that there's an unspoken assumption behind the proposals of Lippmann and Niebuhr and others. Uh, the specialized class are offered the opportunity to manage public affairs by virtue of their subordination to those with real power in our society. That means dominant business interests. That's a crucial fact that is always ignored in the self-praise of the elect. Uh, a few years after turning to the academic social sciences, the influential political scientist Harold Laswell, who more or less initiated the modern field of communications, uh, wrote an article in the Encyclopedia of the Social Sciences, and in it he pointed out that when the state lacks the force to compel obedience, social, social managers must turn to a whole new technique of control, largely through propaganda. And he added the conventional justification. We must recognize the ignorance and stupidity of the masses and not succumb to democratic dogmatisms about men being the best judges of their own interests. They are not, and we must control them for their own good. Uh, the same principle guides the business community with its huge public relations industry dedicated to controlling the public mind, as its leaders put it. Uh, others have developed similar ideas, put them into practice in the ideological institutions, the schools, the universities, the popular media, the elite journals, and so on. Any challenge to these ideas arouses trepidation, sometimes fury, as when students in the 1960s, instead of simply bowing to authority, began to ask too many questions and to explore behind the bound, beyond the bounds that had been established for them. Uh, that brought about a pretense of manning the ramparts against the onslaught of the barbarians, now a popular pose, but in fact scarcely more than comical fraud for anybody who remembers the facts. Uh, a properly functioning system of indoctrination has several different tasks, some of them rather delicate. One of its targets is the stupid and ignorant masses, and they must be kept that way. They must be diverted with emotionally potent oversimplifications, marginalized and isolated. Ideally, each person should be alone in front of a TV screen watching the Super Bowl or soap operas or comedies, anything that doesn't matter, deprived of any organizational structures that could permit individuals to discover what they think about anything 
uh, or what they believe in interaction with others, which is the only way to do it, to formulate their own concerns and programs and to act to realize them. That's got to be barred because it's wrong to let the stupid rabble uh, interfere and just cause trouble. Uh, they can be permitted, in fact, even encouraged, to ratify the decisions of, the, of their betters in periodic elections. That's their role, remember, to occasionally say, we want you to lead us. The rascal multitude are the proper targets of the real mass media and of a public education system that's geared to obedience and training in needed skills, including the skill of repeating patriotic slogans on timely occasions. Uh, the problem of indoctrination is a little bit different for the responsible men, people like us, you know, the business, state, cultural managers, articulate sectors generally. Uh, we, folks like us, uh, we have to internalize the values of the system, and we have to share the necessary illusions that permit it to function in the interests of concentrated power and privilege, or at least we have to be cynical enough uh, to pretend that we do. That's an art that not many people can master, so it's better to really have the beliefs. Uh, uh, the reason is very obvious. Uh, you know, we, us smart guys, we're the ones who are actually doing things, and we better have the right beliefs, or else we might do things that could be dangerous. Nevertheless, elites, we responsible men, as Lipman puts it, uh, we also have to have a certain grasp of the realities of the world, or we won't be able to perform the executive tasks effectively in the interests of power. So the elite media and uh, educational systems have to steer a course through these dilemmas, and that's not an easy task. It's plagued by all sorts of internal contradictions. It's intriguing to see how it's faced. Uh, 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 that, however, is beyond the scope of these remarks, and I suspect a lot of you know a lot about it from your own experience anyway. Uh, well, that's two different tasks for the two different categories of citizens who have their two different functions in a properly working democracy. The question arises whether all this indoctrination works. Uh, and here, in order to answer that question, we have to again distinguish the two groups, the responsible men, sometimes called the political class, the educated, articulate minorities, the ones who do the real decision-making, you know, maybe 20% of the population. And then on the other hand, there's the bewildered herd. And we have to ask, do these tasks, do these uh, functions of the indoctrination system work as they're supposed to for these two groups? That's not a simple question. Uh, it's an interesting one. It's very rarely investigated for obvious reasons, uh, and therefore anything you say about it has to be pretty tentative. Uh, in rough outline, it looks to me kind of like this. As far as the political class is concerned, the educated elites, it looks as though the indoctrination is highly successful. With regard to the bewildered herd, on the other hand, it looks much less so. They may repeat the appropriate slogans, but it's rather thin. Uh, and there's a good deal of evidence for that. So, for example, a couple of weeks ago, you may have seen an article in the New York Times on the Gulf War, which, was, which pointed out that uh, educated, it, it was discussing poll results, and it pointed out that there was no big problem with the more educated part of the population. They were repeating the proper slogans on command, as they were taught to do, uh, and making the right jingoist slogans and so on. But there, was, there were problems with other sectors, like... Uh, the poor and the black sectors, particularly. Those two things are very closely correlated, so it's hard to distinguish them. And there they said there were real problems. You just weren't getting the right, you know, the right responses in the polls. And they then offered an explanation. They said for the more educated part of the population, they're constantly deluged with propaganda, and they never hear any contradictory voice. And as a result, the, uh, the, uh, you know, the right responses are elicited just by uh, you know, by repetition and uh, drilling it in in every day's issue of the New York Times and so on. On the other hand, that other part of the population, they said, is harder for the cue givers to reach. Uh, the reason is that they turn off the tube when Dan Rather goes on, and they don't read the editorials. They just do other things. And as a result, it's kind of hard to get into their heads the right responses that they're supposed to have, and that's a certain problem. Uh, you get these sharp gaps uh, in, in the poll results where the more educated are saying the right things, they're goose-stepping on command, but the less educated have all kind of weird ideas and they're kind of hard to get to. 
That's pretty common, in fact. Uh, during the Vietnam War, contrary to what a lot of people believe, if you actually look at the inquiries into popular opinion, it was pretty much the same way. So uh, the media, contrary to what everybody says, were very hawkish. Uh, and in fact, television and the print press both increased hawkishness on the part of the, pu of the public. That was true right through the Tet Offensive in 1968, quite a number of studies of this. Uh, after business turned against the war in 1968 for largely economic reasons, later you got the press t kind of turning against it too on very narrow tactical grounds. But from that point on, right to the end, there was quite a sharp difference between educated elites and the general population, a striking difference. Uh, among educated elites, uh, what you got was loyalty to the system. And this is true in left liberal sectors as well. So if you look at the, this, you know, there's a couple of studies of elite intellectual opinion. And of course, everybody's against the war, but you know, by 19, say by 1970, everybody's against the war, but in fact, so is everybody. You know, pick up a guy on Wall Street, he's against the war too. It was just costing too much. Uh, if you look at the reasons why they were against the war among the educated elites, it was overwhelmingly what are called pragmatic reasons. It wasn't working. Or else what are called sometimes moral reasons, meaning it's too bloody. So a certain amount of napalm children is okay, but too many napalm children, that's not nice. Uh, virtually nobody among the educated elites opposed the war on what investigators, social science investigators, call ideological grounds, meaning on principle. They think aggression is wrong or something like that. Uh, if you had asked the same question about, say, the Russian inv invasion of Czechoslovakia, which nobody did, the answers would have been quite different. I mean, nobody could have opposed it on pragmatic grounds because it worked. They can't oppose it on those grounds. Uh, you couldn't oppose it on moral grounds because they didn't napalm too many children. You know, only killed a couple dozen people. So no moral objection. In fact, everybody would have opposed it on what, on ideological grounds. Aggression is wrong. Of course, that would never be called ideological. Ideological is a bad word that's used when somebody opposes American aggression. But when you oppose Russian aggression or, you know, Iraqi aggression, that's not you know, that's not ideological grounds, that's just being reasonable. Well, that's intellectual elites. In the studies that exist, probably not more than one or two percent oppose the war on ideological grounds, meaning on grounds of principle, even at the peak moment of opposition to the war, around May 1970, when some of these studies were made at a time when the universities were closed and you know, everything was blowing up. They're interesting studies. On the other hand, the public at the same time was giving radically different results. About two-thirds of the public, this remained constant right through the 1980s, You're getting roughly 70% of the public saying they opposed the war as, in the words of the Gallup poll, fundamentally wrong and immoral, not a mistake, as distinct from the elites who opposed it, but as a mistake, not fundamentally wrong in any sense. That's a very sharp disparity, and it's hard to believe that it's just an artifact. Uh, I think the experience of people who were involved in these things tends to confirm that. Uh, now, you get the same thing showing up again during the Reagan years, strikingly. Uh, the population during the whole Reagan period continued its kind of slow evolution towards kind of New Deal politics, you know, more welfare, more less military spending, more... If you ask, you have to look at the questions and polls carefully. But if questions are asked such as, should we spend more money on, say, education or on military, you got numbers like 4 to 1 or 7 to 1 and so on in favor of the social welfare spending right through the Reagan years. On the other hand, elites had a radically different view. They were virtually all what is now called neoliberal or neoconservative, if there's a difference. I've never been able to understand that exactly. Neo something or other, which means, uh, you know, spend it on the rich benefits for the rich, not for the poor. And again, there was a very sharp split there. Uh, same's true in the case of the current Gulf War. So among elites, you read the editorials, everybody is against what's called linkage. That's a bad thing. You've got to be against linkage. And if you've listened to the cue givers properly, you know that you, when they say linkage, you're supposed to go, oh my God, not linkage. And that's the way educated elites react. Uh, linkage, of course, is just a, an Orwellism for diplomacy. You're supposed to be against diplomacy. Uh, on the other hand, the general population, you know, these guys who can't be reached by the cue givers, they were having problems with that. In fact, up till about two days before the war broke out, 
about two-thirds of the population was in favor of linkage. That is, they wanted a diplomatic settlement if it was tied somehow to a general you know, political settlement of problems in the region. About two-thirds of the population thought that, that was a good idea. Uh, now, it's kind of interesting that these public attitudes throughout this whole period, these are some examples, there's plenty of others, uh, probably the public attitudes are underestimated. You know, again, it all is kind of tentative, like nobody really studies it, so I'm making some tentative guesses. But it's a guess that the public attitudes of opposition to policy are understated. And the reason for that is very simple. The public never hears these things. They're just making up these positions without ever hearing it. Like nobody tells them linkage is a good idea, or the war is fundamentally wrong and immoral, not a mistake, and so on and so forth. They just kind of make it up on their own. If these views were ever articulated so that they could hear them, if they could be discussed, let's say, chances are very strong that the numbers would go up much higher. Uh, so I think it's reasonable to speculate that the disparity, great as it is, is probably understated. Uh, another point that has to be stressed is that the public attitudes are completely irrelevant. And that follows from the principles of democracy. Because remember, the principle of liberal democracy is that the bewildered herd, the great mass of the population, has to be kept out of the political system. That's the idea. They're supposed to be spectators. It really doesn't matter much what they think, as long as there's no way for them to act on it. And a well-designed democracy will prevent them from acting on it. If, if their job is, if their function is what Lippmann and other progressive liberal theorists argue, namely just to lend their weight to one or another member of the uh, elites who all believe more or less the same thing, then it really doesn't matter much what they think. They can think anything they like. They can think linkage is fine, you know, the Vietnam War is immoral, or they want think whatever they like. You know, the genius of American democracy has been to maintain freedom from state coercion while also eliminating the possibilities of organization that might let the bewildered herd act upon or even properly formulate to themselves uh, their own beliefs. Uh, that's an achievement. And if what I just said, which is in part speculation, let me stress again, because the issues are not really studied, uh, if, though they should be, uh, if these conclusions are right, it seems to me they have pretty important consequences, which perhaps are obvious enough without my going on with them. Uh, well, going back to Hume, he posed his paradox for both despotic and more free societies. The more free societies are, of course, by far the more important. As the social world becomes more free and more diverse, the task of inducing submission becomes more complex. And the intellectual problem of unraveling the mechanisms of indoctrination becomes just more interesting. It's a more challenging intellectual problem. But intellectual interest aside, the case of free societies has much greater human significance for the very simple reason that here we're talking about ourselves and we can act on what we learn. And it's exactly for that reason that the dominant culture will always direct us elsewhere. So, for example, when U.S. plans go awry in some corner of the third world, we devote our attention to the defects and the special problems of these cultures and their social disorders and you ask the experts who know something about those regions of the world, we don't look at ourselves. In fact, there are no experts on us. We don't talk about that. Uh, fame and fortune and respect uh, await those who reveal the crimes of official enemies. Those who undertake the vastly more important task of raising a mirror to their own societies, they can expect rather different treatment. So take, for example, George Orwell. He's famous for Animal Farm in 1984 which focus on the official enemy pretty transparently. Had he addressed the much more interesting and far more significant question of thought control in relatively free and democratic societies, it wouldn't have been appreciated. And instead of wide acclaim, he would have faced silent dismissal or obloquy. Let's nevertheless turn to those more important and unacceptable questions. Well, keeping the governments that are more free and popular, why do the governments submit? when force is on their side. Again, we have to look at the prior question, to what extent is force on their side? Well, it becomes a subtle question when the government lacks direct force. Uh, and here are some cares necessary. Societies are considered free and democratic insofar as the power of the state to coerce is limited. And in fact, as I said, the United States is quite unusual in this respect. In fact, perhaps more than anywhere else in the world, the citizen is free from state coercion. 
at least the citizen who is relatively privileged and of the right color, which is a substantial part of the population by comparative world standards. However, it's a mere truism that the state represents only one segment of the nexus of power, control over investment and production and commerce and finance, conditions of work and other crucial aspects of social policy lies outside the state system in private hands. An unwillingness to adapt to that structure of authority and domination that carries costs. Uh, the costs can range from state force to the costs of privation and struggle. And in fact, even an individual of independent mind can hardly fail to compare these to the benefits, however meager, that accrue to submission. Uh, and that tends to narrowly limit the meaningful options. And similar factors limit the range of idea and ideas and opinion in perfectly obvious ways. Articulate expression is shaped by the same private powers that control the economy. The media, after all, are large corporations that sell audiences to advertisers, and they naturally reflect the interests of the owners and their market. The ability to articulate or communicate one's views uh, one's concerns, one's interests, or even to discover them, is thus narrowly constrained as well. Well, apart from the general constraints on choice and articulate opinion that are inherent in the concentration of private power, it also sets quite narrow limits on the actions of government. Again, the United States is quite unusual in this respect among the industrial democracies. It's near the limit in its safeguards from freedom from state coercion, something for which we should be very grateful. It's also near the limits in, it, in the poverty of its political life, probably a related fact. Uh, there is essentially one political party, the business party with two factions. Shifting coalitions of investors account for a very large part of political history. Unions, other popular organizations that might offer a way for the general public to play some role in influencing programs, they scarcely function apart from the narrowest realm. Elections are largely a ritual. Uh, in congressional elections, virtually all incumbents are returned to office. In fact, the rate is higher than in a Politburo. Uh, that's a reflection of the vacuity of the political system. There's scarcely a pretense that substantive issues uh, uh, arise in the presidential campaigns. The articulated programs are understood to be nothing more than a device to garner votes and candidates adjust their messages to their audiences following the uh, advice of public relations tacticians, and this is taken to be quite appropriate. Nobody questions it. Uh, political commentators ponder such questions as whether Reagan will remember his lines, or whether Mondale looks too gloomy, or whether Dukakis can duck the slime that's being thrown at him by Bush's speechwriters. In the 1984 elections, uh, something kind of interesting happened. The two political factions essentially exchanged their traditional policies. The Republicans presented themselves as the party of Keynesian growth and state intervention in the economy. Uh, the Democrats presented themselves as the advocates of fiscal conservatism. It's interesting that few people even noticed the whole thing is regarded as so irrelevant. Half the population doesn't even bother to push the levers, and those who do take the trouble often consciously vote against their own interest, as polls clearly show. Uh, now, these tendencies were accelerated during the Reagan years. The population overwhelmingly opposed the policies of, of his administration, as I mentioned, and even the Reagan voters, the subpart who voted for him, by about three to two, hoped that his legislative program would not be enacted, voting against interest, in other words. In the 1980 election, 4% of the population, of the electorate, 4% of the total electorate voted for Reagan because they regarded him as a real conservative. In 1984, that percentage dropped to 1%. There's a name for that. That's called a landslide victory for conservatism. Furthermore, contrary to much pretense, Reagan's popularity was never particularly high, and much of the population seemed to understand that he was just a media creation who had only the foggiest idea what government policy might be. Now, it's kind of noteworthy that that fact is now conceded. It was hidden for eight years, but now it's conceded, tacitly at least. The instant that the great communicator was no longer of any use as a symbol, 
he was quietly sent out to pasture. Uh, after eight years of pretense about the revolution that Reagan wrought, you'll notice that no one would dream of asking its standard bearer for his thoughts on any topic. And the reason is it's understood, as it always was, that he doesn't have any. When, it was, uh, when uh, his hosts in Japan were kind of surprised and given the fat fee more than a little annoyed to discover that he couldn't hold press conferences uh, or talk on any subject. Now, it's interesting, if you look back at the American press, their discomfiture raised a certain amount of amusement in the American press. The point is that the Japanese had believed what they had read about this remarkable figure. They didn't comprehend the uh, mysterious Occidental mind. Uh, so naturally people make fun of them. Uh, well, this hoax, you know, this hoax, conscious hoax that was perpetrated by the media and the intellectual community, which is now conceded, that's actually of some interest for Hume's problem. The point is that state capitalist democracy has a certain tension with regard to the locus of power. In principle, the people are supposed to rule, but effective power remains largely in private hands with very large-scale effects throughout the whole social order, and that's a problem. Well, one way to, way to reduce that tension is to remove the public from the scene, and the Reagan phenomenon offered a new device for achieving this fundamental goal of capitalist democracy. The office of chief executive was, in effect, abolished in favor of a symbolic figure who was constructed by the public relations industry to perform certain ritual tasks, to appear on ceremonial occasions, uh, to greet visitors, to read government pronouncements, and so on. And that's actually a major advance in the marginalization of the public. Uh, the United States is the most sophisticated of the state capitalist democracies, and it's often led the way in devising means to control the rascal multitude, and this latest inspiration will doubtless be mimicked elsewhere with the usual lag. Uh, even when issues arise in the political system, the concentration of effective power limits the threat that anyone will take them seriously. Now, the question is largely academic in the United States. It almost never happens because of the power of business interests, but in democracies to the South, where conflicting ideas and approaches do reach the political arena, the situation is different and you can learn something from it. As again is familiar, government policies that private power finds unwelcome will lead to capital flight and disinvestment and social decline uh, until business confidence is restored with the abandonment of the threat to privilege. Uh, these facts of life exer exert a decisive influence on the political system of course, there's always military force in reserve if matters get out of hand. Uh, to put the basic point crassly, unless the rich and the powerful are satisfied, everyone will suffer because they control the basic social levers, determining what will be produced, what will be consumed, and what crumbs will filter down to their subjects. So for the homeless in the streets, the primary objective is to ensure that the rich live happily in their mansions. Now that crucial factor, uh, quite apart from control over resources, severely limits the force on the side of the governed and it diminishes Hume's paradox in a well-functioning capitalist democracy in which the general public is scattered and isolated. Uh, under, these issues are well understood, I should say, and understanding of them has long been a guide to policy. The idea is that once popular organizations are dispersed and crushed, and once decision-making power is firmly in the hands of the owners and managers, then democratic forms are quite acceptable, maybe even preferable as a device of legitimation. That was the pattern that was followed by U.S. planners uh, after World War II in reconstructing the industrial societies, as I discussed yesterday, and it's quite standard in the third world. The idea is that once a functioning social order is established, an individual who finds a relatively isolated place within it, in, it just in order to survive, uh, such a person will tend to think its thoughts, to adopt its assumptions about the inevitability of certain forms of authority, and in general will tend to adapt to its ends. Uh, the reason is that the costs of an alternative path are, are pretty high, the resources are lacking, and the prospects are quite limited. 
it's actually quite important to be aware of the very profound commitment of Western opinion to the repression and elimination of freedom and democracy, if and violence by necessary. Uh, to understand our own cultural world, it's useful to recognize that the advocacy of force, even terror, is quite clear, quite explicit, and very principled. And that's true across the political spectrum. It's particularly instructive to see how the issue is formulated at the liberal humanist extreme of the spectrum. So, for example, consider political commentator Michael Kinsley, who represents what's called the left in mainstream commentary and television debate. A couple of years ago, the State Department publicly confirmed U.S. government support for terrorist attacks on agricultural cooperatives in Nicaragua. And Kinsley commented on that. He wrote that we shouldn't be too quick to condemn this official policy. Uh, he said these international terrorist operations doubtless cause vast civilian suffering, but they might succeed to undermine morale and, conf and, and confidence in the government. And if they do, they'll, they're perfectly legitimate. Uh, the policy is sensible, he said, if cost-benefit analysis shows that the amount of blood and misery that will be poured in yields democracy democracy in the conventional sense that I already mentioned, that is ruled by the legitimate elements, uh, business, mil oligarchy, military, and so on, that understand the, uh, uh, they're oriented properly towards U.S. priorities. Now, Kinsley's a spokesman for liberal humanism, and consequently he insists that terror has to meet the pragmatic criterion. That is, we don't employ terror just because we find it to be amusing. Uh, you know, we're not Mengele or something like that. Uh, now, this more humane conception, you know, you employ terror only when it cost-benefit analysis shows that it works, uh, I presume that that would be accepted by Saddam Hussein or Abu Nidal or the Hezbollah kidnappers. Presumably they too consider terror pointless unless it's of some service to their ends. And actually these facts, if you think about them, help us situate enlightened Western opinion on the international spectrum. Uh, an appreciation of uh, what John Quincy Adams called the salutary efficacy of terror, that's long been a standard device of enlightened Western thought. You see this very clearly in the propaganda campaign concerning international terrorism in the 1960s, 1980s. Now, naturally, of course, terrorism directed against us or against our friends is bitterly denounced as a reversion to barbarism. But it's kind of striking that much more extreme terrorism that we and our agents conduct is considered constructive, as in the case I just mentioned, or at worst insignificant, at least if it meets the pragmatic criterion. And it's remarkable how far this goes. Uh, even the vast campaign of international terrorism launched against Cuba since the Kennedy years, which far exceeds anything attributed to official enemies, that literally does not exist in respected scholarly study of international terrorism. Take a look, uh, or for that matter, the mainstream media. So say, take one of the standard scholarly works on terrorism, international terrorism, Walter LeCur, uh, his book on terrorism, standard scholarly source. He does discuss Cuba, and he describes Cuba as a sponsor of the crime of international terrorism. He has various innuendos about Cuba, but not even a pretense of evidence. On the other hand, the campaign of international terrorism against Cuba literally merits not a word. In fact, he goes so far as to class Cuba as one of those societies free from terror, meaning it's only subject to our terror, and that makes it free from terror. Uh, New York Times correspondent Clifford Krauss just last week writes, quoting, Mr. Castro hates the United States with a passion and would destroy it in a second if he could, but fortunately he can't. Uh, the idea is that obviously only a madman could have a passionate hatred for a country that repeatedly tried to assassinate him, had dispatched terrorists to bomb his factories and hotels, sink his fishing boats, poison his crops and livestock, blow up his airplanes and diplomatic missions. So Castro, the fanatic lunatic, does not comprehend what is perfectly obvious to us. These events do not constitute terror because we conducted them. Uh, sometimes the adaptability of the system might surprise even the most hardened observer. I think I'm cynical, but I keep getting surprised. So take, for example, uh, nothing outraged U.S. opinion more 
than the shooting down of KAL-007, the Korean airliner, in September 1983 by the Soviet Air Force. You all remember that. Well, it didn't go entirely unnoticed that the reaction was a little bit different when the U.S. warship Van Sin shot down an Iranian civilian airliner in a commercial corridor off the coast of Iran out of, I'm quoting now, out of a need to prove the viability of its high-tech missile system in the judgment of U.S. Navy Commander David Carlson, who says that he wondered aloud in disbelief as he monitored the events from the naval vessel nearby that he was commanding. That's writing in the Journal of the U.S. Naval Academy. Uh, all of this was dismissed as an unfortunate error in difficult circumstances for which the Iranians were ultimately at fault. Now, the latest act in this instructive drama took place in April 1990, when the commander of the Vincennes, along with the officer in charge of anti-air warfare, they were both given the Legion of Merit Award for, I'm quoting, exceptionally meritorious conduct in the performance of outstanding service and for the calm and professional atmosphere under his command during the period of the destruction of the Iranian Airbus with 290 people killed. The media apparently found nothing worthy of comment in any of this. I couldn't find a word about it. Although Iranian condemnation of the destruction of the airliner is occasionally noted and dismissed with derision, for example, in the New York Times as boilerplate attacks on the United States. Well, Western readers would be hard put to learn of the Legion of Merit Award to the uh, commander of the Vincennes for his meritorious act of shooting down a civilian airliner and murdering 300 people. But it didn't go unnoticed in the third world. Uh, and in fact, there, commentators were also quite able to draw the conclusions that are barred within Western intellectual culture. So for example, there's a Malaysian uh, journal called Third World Resurgence, which it lists the shooting down of the Iranian Airbus among acts of U.S. terrorism in the Middle East, and it quotes the words of the award, which were censored out of the free press here, and it adds the following, the Western public fed on the media sees the situation in black and white one-dimensional terms, unable to perceive what is completely obvious to those who escape the grip of Western enlightenment and indoctrination. Actually, huge massacres are treated quite the same way. Their massacres are crimes, ours are statecraft or understandable error. Uh, my co-author Edward Herman and I have documented an extensive record of two kinds of atrocities, what we call benign and constructive bloodbaths that are acceptable or even advantageous to dominant interests, and nefarious bloodbaths which are perpetrated by official enemies. Uh, the reaction of enlightened circles in the West is remarkably uniform. The former are ignored or denied or sometimes even welcomed, and the latter elicit great outrage and often large-scale deceit and fabrication if the available evidence is felt to be inadequate for doctrinal requirements. We've done a lot of documentation on this, and I think it's one of the best established principles of modern social science, which I concede is not saying a lot, but uh, take a look if you're not convinced. Uh, you take a look at the review of the debate over Central America during the past decade. That reveals quite sharply the significance, the decisive role of the pragmatic criterion. So take Guatemala. Guatemala was never an issue. There was virtually no discussion about it. The reason was because mass slaughter and repression, maybe 100,000 people slaughtered in the last decade, it just seemed to be working. So what's the point of talking about it? It met the, proper, it met the pragmatic criterion, and there's virtually no talk about it. Uh, Central America correspondent Kent Freed of the Los Angeles Times writes that General Hector Gramajo, he says, was a senior commander in the early 1980s when the Guatemalan military was blamed for the death of tens of thousands of people, largely civilians. But, he continues, uh, Gramajo, who incidentally is now happily updating his skills at Harvard, uh, he says, Gramajo is seen as a, mo as a moderate by the U.S. Embassy. Uh, so he joins Mussolini, Hitler, Trujillo, Suharto, Saddam Hussein, and others, although he too will, could quickly become a reincarnation of Genghis Khan, if he demonstrates the sin of independence. You go over to El Salvador and Nicaragua, they also demonstrate the, illustrate the pragmatic criterion. 
the media pretended not to know that the government of El Salvador was conducting mass slaughter from 1979, and in fact they concealed the worst atrocities. By the early 1980s, there was a change. It seemed as if the U.S. might be drawn into a, an intervention which might be harmful to its own interests. Accordingly, concern increased, and there were even a few months of fairly honest reporting. But as the terror appeared to be achieving its goals, thanks to U.S. guidance and support, the qualms were dissipated in favor of the celebration of what was called democracy, while the government continued its programs of terror and intimidation. Now, Nicaragua was an object of contention, and the reason was that terror and economic warfare were achieving only limited success. But these were absolutely the only concerns in elite circles. I think that's been demonstrated beyond serious argument. I won't pursue it. Uh, the pragmatic criterion calls for violence only when the rascal multitude cannot be controlled in other ways, and often there are other ways. One op option short of outright violence is legal repression. Uh, an interesting case of that is Costa Rica. It's the Latin American exception, as everyone calls it. Uh, in Costa Rica, the United States was willing to tolerate social democracy, which is quite unusual. Um, in fact, if you look, only barely tolerated, but they did tolerate it. The primary reason for this benign neglect was that labor was suppressed and the rights of investors were offered every protection. The founder of Costa Rican democracy, Jose Figueres, was an avid partisan of U.S. corporations and of the CIA. Uh, the State Department regarded him as, in their words, the best advertising agency that the United Fruit Company could find in Latin America. Incidentally, the leading figure of Latin America, Central American democracy fell out of favor in the 1980s, and he had to be completely censored out of the free press because of his critical attitude toward uh, the U.S. war against Nicaragua and uh, Washington's efforts to unravel Costa Rican social democracy. In fact, even there was an effusive obituary and editorial, long editorial in the New York Times when he died last year, and it lauded this fighter for democracy but it was very careful to uh, overlook these uh, inconvenient deviations of the past decade. Now, in earlier years, when he was better behaved, uh, Figueres recognized that the Costa Rican Communist Party, which was particularly strong among plantation workers, uh, he said it posed an unacceptable challenge. So he therefore arrested its leaders, declared the party illegal, and repressed its members. And that policy was maintained right through the 1960s, while other efforts to establish any working class party were banned by the state authorities. And Figueres explained these actions with admirable candor. He said, it was a sign of weakness, I admit it. When one is relatively weak before the force of the enemy, it is necessary to have the valor to recognize it. In fact, these moves were accepted in the West as consistent with the liberal concept of democracy. And in fact, they were a precondition to the U.S. toleration of the Costa Rican exception. Sometimes legal repression is not enough. The popular enemy is just too powerful. The alarm bells are sure to ring if they threaten control of the political system by the business landowner elite, properly respectful of U.S. interests. And signs for such deviation call for stronger measures. Actually, El Salvador was a case in point. Uh, began, the decade began with harsh repression of nonviolent activities. After that, the masses were with the guerrillas in the judgment of Jose Napoleon Duarte, who was the U.S. imposed figurehead. And to bar the threat of democracy and social reform, it was therefore necessary for the U.S. to resort to a war of extermination and genocide against a defenseless civilian population. And those are the terms of Archbishop Rivera y Damas. Who suggested the, who replaced, succeeded the assassinated Archbishop Romero. Uh, the continuity of U.S. policy through the decade is very revealing. It's actually rather well illustrated by the record of one battalion, the Atlacado Battalion, the first rapid response battalion established by the U.S. Its soldiers professionally obey orders from their officers to kill the Jesuits in cold blood, America's Watch observed on the 10th anniversary of the assassination of Archbishop Romero pointing out that these two events frame the decade, the assassination of the Archbishop in 1980, the assassination of the six Jesuit intellectuals, their housekeeper, uh, in 1989. And in this study of the America's Watch, which of course never got reported, 
they proceed to review some of the achievements of this elite unit, which, as they say, was created, trained, and equipped by the United States. It was formed in March 1981 when the masses were with the guerrillas, and it was trained by U.S. specialists in counterinsurgency. I'm quoting America's Watch now. From the start, the battalion was engaged in the murder of large numbers of civilians. A professor at the U.S. Army School of the Americas in Fort Benning, Georgia, described its soldiers as particularly ferocious. We've always had a hard time getting them to take prisoners instead of ears, he said. In December 1981, the battalion took part in an operation in which hundreds of civilians were killed in an orgy of murder and rape and burning, over a thousand killed according to the church legal aid office. Later it was involved in the bombing of villages, the murder of hundreds of civilians by shooting, drowning, and other methods, uh, the vast majority being women, children, and the elderly. If you take a close look, you'll notice that its worst atrocities were quite often right after the, it had emerged from retraining exercises by the United States. And that's been the systematic pattern of special warfare in El Salvador since the first major operation of uh, May 1980, the joint operation of the Salvadoran and Honduran armies at uh, the Rio Sampul, where 600 civilians were murdered and mutilated. Uh, that was a slaughter that was revealed at once by the church and human rights investigators and the foreign press, but completely concealed by the U.S. media, which have never reported it to this day. They have their own psychological warfare function to perform. Uh, at home here in the United States, even tiny groups may be subject to, to severe repression if their potential outreach is regarded as too great. So during the campaign that was waged by the National Political Police, the FBI, against the Black Panthers, that included assassination, instigation of ghetto riots, a variety of other means, uh, during that whole quite vicious campaign, the FBI, now we have internal documents from court cases, the FBI estimated the membership of the Black Panthers at about 800. But it added something else. It said, a recent poll indicates that approximately 25% of the black population has a great respect for the Black Panther Party, including 43% of blacks under 21 years of age. So even though they have only 800 members, we can't take any chances. And the repressive agencies of the state proceeded with a campaign of violence and disruption to ensure that the Panthers didn't succeed in organizing as a substantial social or political force. That was done with great success. Incidentally, the organization was decimated and the remnants proceeded to self-destruct. In the same years, there were FBI operations also released under court or this documents released in court uh, or under the Freedom of Information Act. There were FBI operations in the same years through the, from the Kennedy administration on, which targeted the entire new left, uh, the women's movement, the American Indian movement, in fact, everybody, and they were motivated by similar concerns. Uh, the same internal intelligence document that I just quoted warns, I'm quoting it, that the movement of rebellious youth known as the New Left involving and influencing a substantial number of college students is having a serious impact on contemporary society with a potential for serious domestic strife. The New Left has attempted to infiltrate and radicalize labor after failing to subvert and control the mass media. You didn't know how powerful we were. It's established a large network of underground publications which serve the dual purpose of an internal communication network and an external propaganda organ. And it therefore poses a threat to the civilian sector of our society, which has, and that threat, of course, has to be contained by the state security apparatus. In other words, freedom is fine, but within limits, as always. Uh, Hume's paradox, going back to that finally, Hume's paradox arises, think through the logic, only if you suppose that a crucial element of essential human nature is what Bakunin called an instinct for freedom. It's the failure to act upon that instinct that Hume found surprising and paradoxical. And that very same failure uh, inspired Rousseau's classic lament, that people are born free but are everywhere in chains, seduced by the illusions of the civil society that's created by the rich to guarantee their plunder. Uh, uh, what's the status of this 
notion. Well, some people might adopt that assumption that people have an instinct for freedom as one of what are sometimes called the natural beliefs that guide their conduct and their thought. There actually have been efforts to ground that instinct for freedom in a substantive theory of human nature. They're not entirely without interest, but they surely come nowhere near establishing the case. The fact is that like other tenets of common sense, this belief remains what's sometimes called a regulative principle, a principle that you adopt or you reject pretty much on faith. Uh, which choice you have can have large-scale effects for ourselves and for others. Whether the instinct for freedom that's commonly postulated, whether it's real or not, we just do not know. If it is real, history teaches us that it can be dulled, but it has yet to be killed. The courage and dedication of people struggling for freedom, their willingness to confront extreme state terror and violence, it's often quite remarkable in El Salvador and many other places, there's been a slow growth of consciousness over many years, and goals have been achieved that were considered utopian or scarcely contemplated in earlier eras. If you think about the ideals of the radical Democrats of the 17th century, they sound actually pretty innocuous today, except maybe in the United States. But um, at the time, they were considered absolutely appalling uh, by, by liberal thought. Now, uh, an inveterate optimist could look at this record and might express the hope that with a new decade and soon a new century, humanity may be able to overcome some of its social maladies. Others can look at the same record and draw a different lesson. It's very hard to see rational grounds for affirming one or the other perspective. And as in the case of many of the natural beliefs that guide our lives, we can actually do no better than to choose according to our intuition and very often our hopes. Uh, the consequences of that choice are not at all obscure. By denying the instinct for freedom will only prove that humans are a lethal mutation, an evolutionary dead end. By nurturing the instinct for freedom, if it is real, we may find ways of dealing with dreadful human tragedies and problems that are awesome in scale. Thank you. Can I ask you, uh, do you support economic sanctions against Iraq? Yes. Against Iraq? Yes, against Iraq. Yes. You do? Yeah. And I would say that uh, in your own way, you are as much an imperialist as George Bush. You support uh, extending hegemony against third world people by starving them. Mr. No, Bush tells you no. It's going to take too long. Let's shoot them. You so, say no. no it's no. easier to starve them. No, no you're wrong. Outrageous. Well, just to clarify it, you didn't ask me that question. Uh, I don't support sanctions on food. As I think I said yesterday, I agree with the National Council of Churches on that one, that sanctions on food are unconscionable. But sanctions, they're right. Uh, you would like to sabotage their economy? Yes, as long as they're conducting aggression. So you would, like to, aggression. Yeah. you would like to use economic weapon to Against smash aggression. the third world people? No, I would like to save the third world people, the Quake in this case. Uh, I would say, I, I, I think we should, I think we should, have, incidentally, for the benefit of the people of Iraq, of Iraq too, who deserve a lot better than that gangster who you seem to like. I think uh, the, people of, the people yeah. of Iraq, it's none of your business. Who uh, rules right. in Iraq? It's, it's right. the business of the Arab Fine. people. I agree. No, no, it's not the business of the Arab people. It's the business of the Iraqi people. Well, but we disagree the point there. Is, see, that's why I wouldn't suggest sanctions against Iraq if it was within its own borders. I would be opposed, as I have always been opposed, to aiding Saddam Hussein in gaining his power and his ability to control his people by violence. I was against his attack on Iran. I'm in the whole public record of this for years. And I'm against other acts of aggression. In this respect, I would line up with the third world countries who you oppose. Well, I don't agree with that at all. I well, think that's it was absolutely made... the case, and we can prove it. Just take a look at the UN and see who opposes aggression. The Always the third world. I just, you've third made that world. point last night, and I would that's like to true. point out to you that you spoke to a number of third world people who came up to talk to you last night, and they all disagreed with you, no, and you told true. them all that you understood the positions of their no, people better. No, I would point out to you that the governments have to be very careful what they say, because they're, they need aid, they need development grants, they're subject to all sorts of sanctions, as you see what is happening to Yemen, for example, now. Is that why if you're trying to pretend no, that governments are free it. to act against let's coercion, you're wrong. Is that the reason why the third world has typically opposed aggression that's supported by the United States? 
Look, I think that these... Let's be serious. If you say that the, if you say the third world opposes aggression because it has to butter up the United States, how come it consistently opposes aggression supported by the United States? So, for example, when... Well, let's be serious. When Indonesia invaded East Timor, who opposed it? I think that... Who the, opposed it? Question. It is very clear... Who opposed to, it? It is very clear to me that people, many people, throughout the third world are appalled by this sort of behavior and I think you saw a good example of it last night. Everyone who came before you disagreed no, not, with you. So you can choose to believe them or not. I think they have a better idea what Fine. people in their own countries think than you do. Fine. We have a record, we have a long record of aggression carried out by the United, either carried out or supported by the United States. Uh, in Israeli invasion of Lebanon, Indonesian invasion of East Timor, US invasion of Panama, we can give a long list. Take a look at uh, the, the South African Ill occupation of Namibia, long list. Simply ask yourself which country supported it. And you will find that quite consistently in the leadership of opposition to aggression and violation of international law, you find the third world countries. Not because they're seeking aid from the United States. They're opposing the United States. In this case, they did exactly what they always do. They opposed the aggression. And there's no indication either among of, in any part of the third world that I've seen uh, of support for the aggression. There is strong feeling against the U.S. attack, but that's even true, as I said yesterday, of the Iraqi democratic opposition. I mean, there's a democratic opposition in Iraq, in exile, because they can't survive in that tyranny. Uh, uh, they strongly oppose Saddam Hussein. You know, they'd be happy to have him dead. They also strongly oppose the U.S. attack against Iraq. I think you're failing, as before, to make a distinction which is very straightforward in the third world. You see it in third world journals, among third world spokesmen, among third world demonstrations, and so on. People there don't seem to have any problem in following the following principle. Aggression is wrong. Use of violence against aggression is wrong. Okay? Those are two principles which are quite consistent and both quite proper in my view. And there's no problem in holding them both. So it's, it's just a coincidence that everybody here happened to, no, it's from not. the third world, happened to disagree with you. It's certainly That's certainly some kind did, of did bizarre poll, anomaly. Did we take a poll among people from the third people world? That the people of the third world just happened to agree with you okay. and the fact that all the third world people didn't agree. So. That's, look, that is just false and you know it. Yeah. Okay, um, I want to actually get back to the theme of your lecture, uh, which was, I think you quoted Hume's paradox. Yeah. Um, you've constructed, I think, it's a very brilliant and well-constructed argument, and I want to extend my compliments to you. Mm -hmm. uh, but. However, I just want, yeah, there's always that but. <laughs> so, on the but, there's another perspective, which is, again, held by many people from the South, and I'm not going to get into, a, you know, either decrying or an argument with you. I just want to present, very concisely, a different perspective. Okay. And that perspective just put a few thoughts together. One is that America, by and large, benefits from, rather America concentrates the loot of empire and hegemony within its structures, its borders, and so on. Some Americans get a lot of access to that loot. Others don't. There is an internal struggle to redistribute what essentially appears to be loot to some from the outside. The second point is, periodically, America has to engage in wars to defend those from whom the loot is taken and preserve the loot in the North. Now again, some Americans uh, have no qualms about it and openly support it. Other Americans seem to feel uneasy about this whole notion. That leads to the heart of the paradox, which is, there are some who would say, that the unease of some Americans, who in some tertiary way, I suppose even you would have to admit, do share to a certain extent in the benefits of empire, like this microphone, this house, um, the clothes we wear, and so on. Hence, at this point, there are those who might even be so audacious as to, as to suggest that you are engaging in what is called the manufacture of hypocrisy and necessary illusions which then absolve the populist American movement of the burden of empire and the very excesses which you so brilliantly document. I'd just like your comments on that. I don't understand it, so I can't count you. It's very simple. Let me see if I can reduce it to details. I'll uh, reduce it to one sentence. Uh, yeah, go ahead. One sentence. 
a lot of people in this country, to some extent or the other, do benefit from what is comparatively a fairly good standard of living. That's right. Some people in the administration, in the Pentagon, and all the other places actually go out and fight wars. That's right. Others feel uneasy about those wars right. and need a carefully constructed moral protector, protector. to absolve themselves. Well, that's really weird. I submit I mean, that you create a series of illusions which absolve well, totally illusions? a populist what? segment of American society from any guilt. Well, now, I'm not saying yeah, if they're, if they're guilty, I'm religion. saying they have some Fine. small, minute fraction of share in the guilt and you refuse okay. to admit it. Point, that I don't understand. I mean, it's certainly true that, you know, the, there are plenty of people in the United States who have quite courageously opposed third, uh, U.S. violence. I mean, you know, I don't want to talk about myself, but I was up for a five-year jail sentence. That wasn't because I was trying to, you know... No, uh, I respect support. that. Okay, now, wh now what does that mean? You know, there's a lot of opposition here to U.S. violence against the third world. Now, in fact, there are third, third world elites generally share and the, they, they, they participate in the violence. You know, they're the one, they are the uh, associates of the American elites. They work together in violence against their own people. There are plenty of people, both in the third world and here, who oppose that, and they should. Now, where's the paradox? The paradox is that are you absolving all those in populist movements here? I'm not asking you to absolve anybody in the third world, whether it's elites, semi-elites, under-elites, or the oppressed. I'm saying, are you trying to absolve all the people of the American populist movements from some certain tertiary distant connection to the excesses that we see going on in our country? Well, did anybody here hear me absolving the American population of participation in atrocities? Okay, I didn't hear myself either, so you're living in some different world, I'm afraid. Yes, my framework is a little smooth. No, it's not different. Nobody heard me say any of those things, except you. Certainly, I'm not saying yeah, that. I have a singularly difficult um, well, you know, well, audio audio is, problem. I didn't hear myself say that, and nobody else seemed to hear me say it, so you might ask yourself why you heard me that, say that's it. That's fine. You're an expert in grammar and linguistics. Well, look, I think you know what I, I, mean. I just asked people, let's have a show of hands. How many people heard me absolving the American population of any minor part in guilt for oppression of people at home or abroad? You heard me absolve American people? I'm not saying at all that you can't do anything about it. You can do a great deal about it. I spent most of my life trying to do something about it, as have plenty of other people. Of course, you can do a lot about it. I mean, you can sit around and, if you want, you can... Pardon? What's overwhelming? There's a pro-democracy campaign. You're saying we have to do more against it. I agree. Let's do more against it. Fine. There's a you pro-democracy campaign right here at Amherst, and anybody can get involved, and we're dedicated to democracy in the United States as a first step for world peace, and it involves first off some serious election reform, total public campaign funding for all elections in this country, and the number is 549-1766. There is hope! Um, my question is how... Uh, has to do with some of the things that you talked about in the, the sort of indoctrination of the power elite. You know, the power elite sort of has these attitudes towards the third world and it benefits in these ways and censors the media in these ways. And I was wondering how, in your opinion, is this doc indoctrination accomplished? Um, you know, most of the people in here are students and hence, um, and a number of them are sort of in some sense, you know, economically privileged and in some sense, some of them are, you know, in a position to be the next power elite, the next ruling class. How is this indoctrination taking place in such a way that nobody's seeing it, and that the people here who may start very ideologically are being indoctrinated without, without it really being obvious? Well, I presume you're a student here or something like that, mm -hmm. or a faculty member or something, I can't see. Yeah. Well, then I think you would have been able to answer the question yourself because you've been subjected to years and years of indoctrination, just as I have, and therefore you've got plenty of experience in how it's carried out. If you want to see it, try to take, get an accurate look at the facts. I mean, take, say, any of the to topics I mentioned, or dozens of others. Take, say, the campaign over international terrorism. How did the, how did educated elites succeed in convincing themselves and others that terrorism is something conducted against us, whereas if you look at the record, you'll see quite clearly that the United States is, if not the leader, or certainly one of the major leaders in international terrorism. Well, ask how that was done. 
And I think it's clear how it was done. It was done by suppressing some facts, uh, emphasizing others, falsifying others, framing things in a particular way, you know, bombarding people with certain stories while not even mentioning other stories and so on. That's the way indoctrination works on every single issue. So in your opinion, this is a, rather than sort of um, explicit um, attitudes, these are more sort of um, institutionalized, sort of subtle attitudes on the part no, of... I don't think it's all that subtle. Involved. I mean, when, when you read, so let's take something really trivially obvious, no, like no, the fact... What, Okay, let's, let's take a real case. Okay, the United States invaded South Vietnam 30 years ago. Okay, in the last 30 years, I have not found one phrase in any U.S. journal, uh, media or journal of opinion, just stating the obvious. The United States attacked South Vietnam or anything comparable, you know, invaded South Vietnam, whatever terminology you want to put. Is that subtle? I mean, suppose you went 30 years and you didn't find one reference in the Soviet Union to the fact that the Soviet Union invaded Afghanistan in 1979. Would you regard that as subtle? Well, that's pretty obvious, I think. Yeah, that's not exactly what I meant by subtle. Well, um, I think that's indoctrination. Yeah, yeah. That's the way indoctrination works. Yes. Indoctrination works when we keep driving into people's heads that when we bomb another country, we're defending it. That's indoctrination. And it works. Among educated elites, at least, it works very well. You get it from childhood. You know, you start getting it in early childhood, and it goes on from there. Like the thing I quoted from the New York Times says, you really never hear anything different. You know, you always hear the same story. It gets pounded into your head, uh, and ultimately believe it. I and mean, it's very hard not to believe it, especially when you have no ways, no methods are established for organization and alternative uh, expressions of opinion and so on. So, yeah, you end up believing it. Actually, there are plenty of people who don't believe it. And those people are usually weeded out of the system in one way or another. And what's left inside is the people who are obedient enough to believe it. So that's the way it works. Actually, I talked about this in one of the classes today. I suspect, without knowing any of you, but just knowing you know, myself and enough people like me, that if you think about your own experience, you'll get a very clear answer as to how it works. Uh, everybody who's a student at Amherst, or who went to Harvard like I did, or you know, went to any good school, almost every such person had approximately the same experience. We went through from kindergarten through high school being obedient. That's the way we made it to the good colleges. Uh, now, there were other, so like for example, you know, I'm sure, I know I did, and I suspect you did, when you get a really stupid assignment in you know, 11th grade or something from some history teacher, and you think it's really idiotic, uh, people like us don't say, you're an idiot, I'm not going to do it. Uh, what you say is, well, you know, I want to go to college, so I'll do it in the hell of it. Uh, and you start doing that in kindergarten, you do it all the way through. And uh, some people do, that is, the obedient ones, like us. Uh, now, if you keep doing something long enough, you start believing what you're doing. It's extremely hard to say one thing and believe another, you know. So by and large, the obedient folks like us end up believing what we say. Now, there are other people who weren't obedient, and I'll bet you if you think about your own school career, you'll remember them. There were other people who, when the teacher said, do some idiotic thing, they said, I'm not going to do it. It's ridiculous. You know. uh, they didn't make it to the next grade. You know. They were behavior problems or some other thing, and they get weeded out. And that goes on all through your career. There's a whole series of filtering devices. I, I, it's hard for me to believe that everyone here doesn't know about it from your own experience. There's a whole set of filtering devices which ensures that the more obedient types like us will make it through. And other less obedient types, more independent minds, they'll be kind of weeded out. And by and large, the obedient types tend to end up believing what's useful for them, for them, including the things they say and the things that get them ahead and so on. There are very few people who are cynic for, cynical enough to be able to continually say one thing and believe something else heart, you know. So the people who get through are the ones who believe what they say. And that goes right through the professions, goes through journalism, academic life, and everything else. Uh, there's a power structure behind it that's imposing the institutional framework within which it all works. It's not coming from angels or something. And, you know, that, those are the way. And, and then there's, there's also conscious planning. There's very conscious planning. Uh, the public relations industry, for example, spend something like a billion dollars a year for very conscious planning to inculcate certain attitudes and uh, to create certain values and to ensure that that's all you're seeing at any moment of the day and so on. 
and the academic profession and the journalistic professions, they do the same thing to some extent. So out of all of this comes an institutional system of indoctrination. It's, an important, it's a powerful system. It's needed in countries which are relatively free, like ours, uh, for exactly the reasons I mentioned. You've got to keep the bewildered herd out of trouble, and you've got to keep the responsible men indoctrinated. And by and large, it works pretty well. That's why you can have things like, for example, going for 30 years without recognizing the triviality that we attacked at South Vietnam and that that's what the war was all about. Or you can go along for year after year believing that international terrorism is something directed against us when it's transparent that it's directed against others. You know, and we direct it just overwhelmingly. And so on in case after case after case. That's why you can believe that we support democracy when we uh, when we attack a country that had a free election, like Nicaragua, and we, uh, we support a country where they had what we call elections after the security forces that we back had blown up the newspapers, uh, murdered the archbishop, killed off the political opposition, and so on, for a free election. You can do those things if you have sufficiently effective indoctrination. That's the way it works. And I, I can't believe that you haven't, having all experienced this all your lives, it doesn't seem to me believable that you can't figure out how it's done. I think you've got to recognize the fact, which takes a little awareness and so on. You've got to ask how it, you know, why it works, what's the institutional background behind it, how can I decode the truth, and how can I act upon it to change this world. Those are things you have to ask, but not how it's done. That should be obvious. Hi, I have a question. In your lecture, which I enjoyed very much, you spoke a lot about um, what the giddy multitude, the, the powerful elite versus the giddy multitude, and the need to indoctrinate, to marginalize, um, the necessary illusions that are involved. I have a question as a woman, uh, and as a mother of daughters, are women confronted with double illusions? So not only do we have the illusion that's perpetrated in relation to our government and the way everything is supposed to work, but is there also the illusion that, that women have a fair um, chance at the myth, at the end result of the illusion? Sure, I follow. Okay. Where you didn't ever mention men and women. No, I you know I was quoting, remember, and all the quotes say men because that's all anybody considers. You know, that's why. Right. I, you know. So, so my question is, where do you put women in this? Or well, I wasn't too? giving the opinions. I was quoting what people say. I mean, as far as I'm concerned, it's just people, you know, but I wasn't giving my opinions. I was quoting doctrines, and the doctrines happen to talk about men. Do you think women have a double illusion? Well, women have plenty of illusions, and in fact, a lot of those illusions have been, you know, peeled away in the last 20 or 30 years. In fact, there's a lot, you know, very striking the way it works. I mean, take, say, something like attitudes towards war. Uh, you know, here the polling results are quite interesting. You go back to the mid-1960s, and men and women had approximately the same reactions on that whole range of questions. You know, uh, in the 1990s, ever since then, there's been a growing gap, what they call the gender gap. Uh, and if you look at it, it just kind of grows regularly. And by about 1990, it got to be huge. It's now like 20, 25 percent. Uh, that's a very striking gap. What does that mean? Well, you know, you can fig try to figure out what it means. Well, whatever it is, it's got to be an influence of the feminist movement, which did offer a mode of organization for people, did offer ways for people to do something together. And that, that brings about changes. That's why there's such efforts made to prevent organization. Well, what did it do? Okay, here you have two different interpretations, and people have to sort of figure it out. I don't know the answer. Uh, but there's one of two possibilities, as far as I can see. Either women always did have different attitudes and were afraid to express them, or even to acknowledge that they had them, or else women didn't have different attitudes and now have different attitudes. It's got to be one or the other. Which is the right answer? Well, that'd be interesting to figure out, you know might be helpful for further organizing and so on. But I think that's a real question. I think you know, maybe women ought to think about it. Maybe they have the answer, in fact. Did women think the same thing 20 years ago, 25 years ago, but just didn't think it's appropriate to express it because you've got to listen to you know, what your husband says or something? Or 
uh, did the experience of the feminist movement actually bring out different attitudes and understandings? You know, bring out things that were latent that you didn't even know you believed. That's pretty common in the course of organization and struggle and so on. You just bring out things you didn't know you believed. You know, that can happen too. Uh, and some mixture of those is probably true, probably different for different people. But that also suggests, I and mean, I don't think women and men are genetically different in this respect, so I think the same thing could happen with other forms of organization, and it does in organized groups of men, you know, not disorganized groups, disorganized, atomized people, then it doesn't happen. A comment and a question. The comment is simply this, that in 1992 we have to ask ourselves, are we going to celebrate the discovery of America or the European invasion of the Americas? <laughs>